everyone. Welcome to another lovely interview at Room for Discussion. Today, we have the opportunity to dive headfirst into the ever-changing world of central banking, where every decision has ripple effects that reach far beyond just the financial sector. But today is, of course, not just about the theory. We'll be sitting with someone who has first-hand experience being right at the steering wheel making these decisions. Now, over the past couple months, you've probably heard terms like unemployment, inequality, inflation, economic growth, and maybe even changing interest rates. And you might be thinking, what do they all really mean? Well, don't worry, you're in luck. Because today we have an opportunity to tap into the mind of someone with decades of experience in central banking. Klaus Knot is the president of the Dutch Central Bank and the chair of the Financial Stability Board. He's seen it all, through the financial crisis to the challenges emerging from the digital finance. We're here to learn his takes on how central banks can stay ahead of the curve, control the prices, and what he sees for us in the future. Well, without further ado, let's welcome President Klaus Knot on our stage. Well, welcome, President Knot. It has been over six years since you last sat on Room for Discussion couches. Would you say that your time since then working in European Central Bank, Dutch Central Bank, Financial Stability Board has been a smooth ride? <laughs> no, I, uh, I wouldn't say so. Uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I was here in 2012, 2018, 2024. So well, you can't ignore the fact that I'm a rather structured person. <laughs> um, but in 2018, obviously, yeah, we came out of a period, uh, the aftermath of the, uh, the debt crisis, the low inflation, etc. If you think about what happened between 2018 and 24, we had the pandemic. We had Russia's unjustifiable act of aggression yeah, versus Ukraine with the inflation shooting up to an unprecedented levels. So I, I wouldn't say, huh? I wouldn't use the term uh, smooth ride uh, for any of these episodes. It's interesting that we, huh? in my period, I've now experienced both a period of huh? uh, below target inflation and for a long, long time, a protracted period of time, as well as a high inflation uh, shock. Yeah. So in that sense, uh, uh, it has been uh, quite an experience, yeah. yeah. Well, would you say, given your time at these institutions, you sort of managed to achieve the goals or some of the goals that you set out to do? Well, I mean, our goals are, of course, given by our mandate. Eh? And if I begin again eh, with the, um, uh, the activities that I undertake in Frankfurt as being part of the, uh, the governing council of the European Central Bank, our mandate is very clear. It's price stability, eh, which we translate in an uh, inflation rate of 2% uh, over the medium uh, term. We have had difficulty achieving exactly uh, that 2% uh, inflation target, both in the, in the low inflation period when we had huge difficulties in, in getting inflation a little bit up. Eh? I, I liken that to us doing a rain dance for more inflation <laughs> every now and then. And then, of course, we had two massive shocks, mm -hmm. two massive negative supply shocks eh, coming out of the pandemic. Well, the pandemic, of course, was a, a whole array of shocks, but coming out of the pandemic, we had a, a strong positive demand shock yeah, by having a stronger reopening than we had anticipated. And then on top of that, we had the energy crisis in the aftermath of Russia's invasion, which was a huge negative supply shock. Um, and that brought inflation even in, into double-digit uh, numbers then, of course, uh, as a central banker, you can't do too much about the initial shocks. I mean, these are a given. Your mandate is then to take back inflation to its 2% target yeah. as quickly as possible, but also with proportionality also in the back of your mind, yeah? with sort of trying to limit the damage of what you have to do for, let's say, economic growth, employment, uh, and etc. Now, it now looks as if I would say we have a credible prospect eh, that we will achieve our 2% target somewhere in the course of 2025, which means that inflation will have been above target for four consecutive years. In and of itself, if that were to materialize, and of course I have to eh, keep a, a small caveat, you never know what happens, but if that were to materialize, I think that's a well defendable achievement, eh, given the enormity of the inflation shock that we had to tackle 
uh, that if we were to come back within target within four years time, I think that's quite a decent yeah. achievement. Yeah. Well, you kind of already touched upon it with the shocks, but was there a specific moment when you were sitting in the office and just thinking, I did not sign up for this? <laughs> I, I think I, I mean, as a central banker, you learn uh, that you have to live with the world as is and not with the world as you perhaps pretended should be or would be. <laughs> so uh, you have to always be prepared uh, for the unthinkable. I, I think that that comes with the territory. Mm -hmm. And that makes it also intellectually so challenging. Uh, I think that's the nice thing about it. I mean, I always joke about crisis. Uh, I prefer not to have crisis, but if there is a crisis, I'd yeah. rather be part of it because I think uh, there's a lot you learn and uh, there's a lot of yeah, challenging problems that you have to solve, uh, which is part and parcel of the job of a central banker. Mm -hmm. And in the last couple of years, couple of months, we have heard so much news about different economic indicators. We can think about unemployment, inflation, raising interest rates, now cutting the interest rates, and it's easy to get lost in all of that. Could you paint us a picture, where do we stand right now with the state of the European economy, and more specifically, Dutch yeah. economy? I would say, if you feel that you get lost, always think about 2% medium term. Yeah, that's always the spot on the horizon that should give you the predictability and the anchor. Why did we raise rates? Because we had inflation significantly above target. Why are we now in the process of cutting rates? Because inflation is coming back toward target. And that means that we don't no longer need the intensity of the restriction mm -hmm. that we impose upon economic activity by having interest rates that are relatively high. Yeah. So we don't need as high interest rates anymore today as we did, for instance, one or two years ago. That's the reason why we are gradually taking our foot off the brake, mm -hmm. uh, if it were sort of the metaphor of a car, uh, driving a car. We don't have to sort of push the gas pedal. There's no need for stimulus. No, inflation is still above target. But we need less restriction than uh, we used to uh, have. And that's why we are gradually now and cautiously lowering interest rates again and, and take it back to more neutral levels. Mm -hmm. And if we sort of zoom on and look across the Atlantic, the US is having a larger economic growth and surely lower inflation rates as well. Do you think it seems like the US is having a better response to the recent periods of crisis, as you've kind of mentioned? So ignoring the if events of this week, uh, would you say it's easier to be yeah. Jerome Powell than to be Christine Lagarde? Yeah, US citizens don't <laughs> seem to agree with you <laughs> if you look at the exit polls yeah. and the types of questions yeah. that were being asked about yeah, how yeah. satisfied the voters were with the economic conditions in the US. But anyway, no, let me say, I mean, first of all, on European growth, because I didn't come to that mm -hmm. in the next question. I mean, we have had a period of very sluggish growth. That cannot be denied. But to some extent, uh, that was a, a feature, not a bug. We were tightening monetary policy because we wanted to squeeze out inflation um, and we wanted to put an end to the second round effects through wages and uh, etc. In and of itself, as an economist, I am optimistic about the sort of the outlook for economic growth. Why is that the case? Because if you look at the fundamentals for consumer demand in the euro area, real incomes, are increasing. Consumers are already sitting on a pile of savings. There's, there's really no need uh, to sort of restore any financial imbalance or what have you. The labor market in the euro area continues to provide full employment. So there is very little employment uncertainty as well. And interest rates are coming down. So if you add all these figures up, there should be a recovery in consumption around the corner. The problem is that that corner seems to be shifting with us and we don't know when we will turn the corner and what is weighing down on consumption is probably genuine uncertainty. Political uncertainty, uncertainty about the trajectory of fiscal consolidation in certain countries, um, maybe trade and openness, whether uh, Europe can continue to have yeah, to continue to benefit as much from open and international trade as it traditionally has, given eh, where the rhetoric is, is going uh, around the US elections. So this uncertainty is apparently eh, weighing on, uh, on consumption. 
But I don't believe that it will weigh on consumption indefinitely. Mm -hmm. At some point, the structural challenges in, for instance, Germany will be resolved. Mm -hmm. And there are actually some green shoots that also came out today, which suggest that maybe yeah, uh, the bottom has been achieved there. Um, so in that sense, I, I do think that the outlook for the euro area, I, in, in a recent speech, I likened it to October weather in Amsterdam. Not as bad as people make you believe, but not great either. <laughs> And, and I think that's still a fair assessment. Um, now, if you compare it to the US, yeah, the US is an entirely different economy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, part of the growth differential between the US and Europe is due to immigration. That is, yeah, there have been studies by the Fed uh, which have clearly demonstrated that a lot of the sort of strong growth that the US economy has produced over the last few years is for a large part due to massive immigration, which of course is creating social tensions also uh, in the US, but nonetheless is responsible for uh, part of the growth differential that there is with Europe. There is also a difference in productivity growth, and that's the more worrying part, uh, because in Europe, I think productivity growth at the end of the day will be our only source of uh, uh, sustainable increases in prosperity. Our population is aging, so yeah, we cannot expect too much extra labor supply coming from demographics. On the contrary, we, we might at some point be confronted uh, uh, with a situation in which labor supply might be shrinking. There are still some areas where maybe we can push up labor force participation a little bit, but there's not too much mileage in there anymore. So the real worrying thing is the lack of productivity growth. And unfortunately, also on that score, the US has done uh, a bit better than, uh, than Europe. And that is where also the Draghi report, of course, yeah, comes in to tackle some of these sort of root causes of why productivity growth has been so disappointing in the euro area. Yeah. And bringing it back to the national level and talking about inflation a bit more, in your annual report released by DNB in March, you mentioned that you expect 2.9% inflation in the Netherlands. Current reports indicate 3.6% in October. Do you think we are still on a track to hit this sub 2% rate by the end of 2025? Well, you have to make a little bit of a distinction here between the euro area and the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So the optimism that I just uh, voiced on us reaching our inflation target somewhere in the course of 2025 relates to the euro area. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to be very clear on this, I think most people know, but we do conduct monetary policy on the basis of euro area mm -hmm. outlook and euro area uh, uh, inflation target. The Netherlands is a little bit of a special case within the euro area in the sense that our labor market is even tighter than it is on average in the euro area. Our economy has probably been overheated mm -hmm. for a little bit longer yeah. already. And that leads to the situation that the inflation rate in the Netherlands is above the euro area average. Well, I mean, if you shoot for a 2% euro area average, you will never have a world in which all 20 countries are exactly at 2%, right? You will always have yeah. variation around the average, like there is variation between Kentucky and California around uh, the US inflation rate. So Netherlands at this moment is on the high end of the inflation spectrum. It can be well explained and well rationalized why that is the case. I think yeah, the, the labor market, which leads to higher wage growth, which leads to higher services inflation, etc. Still, I do think that also in the Netherlands, we are on the path toward 2% inflation, but it might take a little bit longer. The projections you refer to had inflation return to 2% in the Netherlands in 2026. In the next vintage of our projections for the Netherlands, we will probably have to revise upward a little bit in light of uh, the, 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 the data points coming in that you mentioned, which will mean that it will be either 26, 27, in which I expect also uh, uh, inflation rate in the Netherlands to, to come back to 2%. Let's hope that that really happens, because there is, of course, a risk that the longer inflation stays above 2%, that gradually this gets embedded into inflation expectation, that we would have a slight de-anchoring of inflation expectations, and that would be quite bad news. Yeah. I think one of the successes of central banking against the background of the current inflation wave, and which clearly <laughs> sets this experience aside from the experience of the 1970s, mm -hmm. is the fact that this time around, we managed to keep inflation expectations well anchored. 
they drifted away a little bit from the 2%, but whatever measures you take, huh, they never exceeded 2.5%. Uh, so it was all pretty, pretty contained. That was completely different in the 1970s, I can assure you. But that is, of course, that is perhaps the most valuable asset that central banks have, the anchoring properties of inflation expectations. And that is something you don't want to put into jeopardy. Yeah. But sort of in light of what you said in the numbers that we've mentioned so far, would you say that the ECB took a bit of a risk by cutting the rates now? No, I wouldn't say so. I mean, we have a medium-term objective, mm -hmm. which means that we don't shoot for inflation today. We shoot for inflation 18 to 24 months, uh, although this is, uh, we never defined exactly what the medium term was. It depends on the size of the shock, the persistence and the effectiveness of uh, the remedies to the shock. But nonetheless, uh, it's generally we taken as 18 to 24 months. And that means that we continuously update our expe expectation on where inflation will be 18 to 24 months. We use models, but we also use narratives. We use underlying trend analysis, etc. a whole range of of, of methodologies to assess that. And if that, if that projection, as long as that projection is sort of showing a return to price stability of 2%, then we don't need these higher interest rates anymore. Uh, but that, of course, we monitor each time whether we still are on this disinflation path toward 2%. If we got new shocks or there were unexpected deviations, then we would probably discontinue cutting interest yep. rates until we had more confidence again. Yep. Now, we are currently in the situation, I want to repeat that, that we are quite confident and that our confidence is actually growing that we will deliver the 2%. That's good news because it means we don't need that level of restriction anymore. Mm -hmm. And sort of moving away from inflation, we are also currently witnessing a, uh, a overheating within the housing market in the Netherlands. <coughs> so if you were to say start off with the supply side only, how would you say the current monetary policy is helping the Netherlands' situation there? Um, well, I mean, uh, whether it's helping or hindering, I wouldn't cast it in these terms because uh, essentially, I repeat, monetary policy is being conducted with a view to euro area inflation. It's not being conducted with respect to developments of the, uh, of the Dutch housing market. But of course, the mortgage rate plays an important role in affordability of homes and thereby in the rate of price increases. Yeah, house prices in the Netherlands are going up again, again double digit unfortunately. This can be very well explained. Real, real incomes are going up, yeah, uh, contractual wages 6.2% this year and the 10 year mortgage rate has come down. Yeah. It has come down from roughly 4.1 to 3.7 or so. Yeah? And that means that there is more affordability, more purchasing power, and that tra immediately translates into higher house prices in the Netherlands because the supply of housing is pretty, pretty rigid. So it's almost a, a demand and supply curve where the supply is vertical and any movement you have in demand immediately ends up in, in higher prices. Unfortunately, not in more square meters of housing consumption, which where in an ideal world you would want it to end up. Mm -hmm. And moving to one of the next challenges that we face in the Netherlands right now. One of the potential risks mentioned in your yearly report that we brought before is running toward capacity limits in the Netherlands. Yeah. With being a small country, over overtaxed power grid, over an infrastructure, aging population, as you also mentioned. Do you think simulating further growth with rate cuts right now might strain these resources even more? Um. Well, it is clear uh, that, um, that the challenges that the Dutch economy is facing are on the supply side of the economy, yeah. not on the demand side. Mm -hmm. There is enough uh, aggregate demand for uh, goods and services that are produced, and indeed lower interest rates might uh, lead to even higher demand. Well, that means that supply will have to respond to it, and that's, uh, that fits into the story that we have to focus our sort of policy initiatives and our policy energy on removing some of these uh, supply obstacles. Mm -hmm. If anything, economics is of course the science that deals with scarcity, right? Yeah, that yeah. deals with gaps between demand and supply. And the price mechanism is a very, very powerful, is probably the most powerful mechanism that we have to resolve these issues. So what I'm saying is that we should allow 
the price mechanism to work. And we should make sure that forms of production in the Dutch economy, which are not priced correctly and which take place on the subsidized pricing below the true cost price, I don't think we should continue to condone these types of activities. We should make sure that everywhere in the economy, as much as possible, had the true cost price of production is being uh, accounted for. Um, and that should resolve uh, this issue of, of the gap between demand and supply. That should resolve scarcity issues when it comes to dividing up physical space, but also carbon space, nitrogen space. You didn't mention those. Uh, the electricity yeah. grid that needs significant investment, but that investment will be, I think, rewarding. Uh, why? Because there is enough demand in the economy yeah, to actually uh, rationalize such uh, investments. Mm -hmm. I think now is a good time to look at our audience and see if we have any questions. If you do, please raise your hand and some will, someone will come with a microphone. Yes, we have one in the front. Thank you for being here. I have a question because like some economists argue that the inflation mostly came from supply shock and energy crisis and that therefore the increasing interest rate might, might maybe not the, the best approach. What's your opinion about that? Thank well, uh, I think I heard two wrongs. <laughs> and there's a song saying two wrongs can make a right, but not in this instance. First of all, I'll, I do not agree with your analysis of what drove inflation entirely. I do think it had a significant supply uh, element to it. I entirely agree with you. But unfortunately, it also had a very strong demand component to it. Yeah, the reopening effects from the COVID. We did a lot of analysis within DNB at trying to decompose the inflation shock. And what we saw was actually uh, positive shock to inflation, but we also saw positive shocks to growth. And had it only been negative supply shocks driving inflation, then we would have seen negative shocks to growth. But we saw positive surprises also in terms of the growth performance. So that demonstrated that it was a mixture of both positive demand shock, negative supply shock. The composition of that Bit of an issue. Yeah. Any audio no. One second. If someone. Maybe it's better just put it right over here. Yeah, I think someone is coming yeah, now with the, with the microphone. No, apologies for that. Yeah, okay. Um, the decomposition in between what part of the inflation was due to the positive demand and the negative supply shock may well have differed between the US and Europe. Where in Europe, larger part of the inflation shock was due to the negative supply shocks of the increasing energy prices. The US, on the one hand, was much less vulnerable to the increase in energy prices because essentially the US is self-sufficient when it comes to energy provision. But on the other hand, the US had a much stronger demand component because of the Biden fiscal stimulus at a moment in which the economy was already overheated, which led to this huge inflation wave in, huh, in the US. So even though the, the composition of inflation was different, if you compared the inflation rates, the, the, the outcomes were not all that sort of dissimilar between huh, Europe on the one hand and the US on the other. So we both had an inflation shock, although the sources were slightly different. But that is to say, in Europe it was not only supply, there was also a demand component. Smaller than in the US, but it was there. Your second sort of assumption was that if it was only a supply shock, that central banks would have to look through and not respond by raising interest rates. And that I also challenge, because that is only true if you really are convinced that this is a short-lived supply shock, and if you are convinced that inflation expectations will remain anchored. But if the shock is so huge that you can predict with almost certainty that there will be a reaction in wages, that there will be second round effects, eh, because trade unions will want to be compensated for the loss in purchasing power, and that the second round effects will be such that that give, will give rise to a further cost push shock, 
which will give rise to a third round effect, etc. The moment you see these multiple round effects coming, then you know for sure that the shock will not be transitory, that it will be more permanent, that the risk of inflation expectations, the anchoring becomes unsustainably large, and then you have to respond. And that was actually what happened. I mean, if you look back at what the ECB did, in 2021, part of the inflation was because of these bottlenecks in the international provision of goods. Yeah, the supply, international supply of goods and services could not keep up pace with the increase in demand when, the, when our economies reopened. So the initial reaction of the central bankers was, well, maybe this is just temporary. Maybe these bottlenecks in the international provision of goods, yeah, the closure of the Suez Canal, all these ships outside Los Angeles Harbor, etc. maybe they will resolve themselves within 12 to 18 months, and then we don't have to respond. But then came February 2022, 20, uh, the war in Ukraine and the explosion of gas price, and then immediately we understood, uh oh, this is not going to be transitory, and there will be second round, third round effects. And then we started aggressively responding. Okay, we'll have one more audience question, maybe someone there in the back. Yes. Um, uh, for a long time, monetary policy was very loose. When central banks started raising interest rates in 2021 and 2022, that caused a lot of chaos on bond markets, where bond prices really decreased a lot. And that uh, caused financial institutions to be in trouble. Um, is there an argument to be made that financial stability should be added to the mandate to prevent uh, this chaos on bond markets if uh, inflation rises again unexpectedly? It's an excellent question, but it leads me to a different answer than the one you suggested. First of all, we know that financial crisis and financial instability has a tendency, tendency to be become deflationary very quickly, with very negative impact on the economies, etc. And in 2008, 2009, we saw the extreme version of it, yeah, where there was a severe risk that the economy would go into a tailspin, etc. And then, of course, that automatically then enters into our inflation mandate and thereby financial stability through price stability or the lack thereof enters into our, our mandate. So yes, financial stability is taken into account because we know it has the potential to have an impact on, uh, on, on price stability. But the example that you mentioned is actually quite an interesting one because within a period of 12 to 14 months, all global central banks raised interest rates by 400, 500, 600 basis points. And this was a synchronized tightening in 22, 23. Had you asked me before and said, oh, and by the way, such a tightening is a massive shock to the financial system, is a massive shock to the banks, to the bank's balance sheets, etc. Had you told me before, that we would be all be doing this in the face of these shocks. And the only damage that was observable in the banking system was a couple of second tier US banks that were kept outside the regulatory parameter anyway by the US authorities, so that were not subject to the Basel III and, uh, and, and everything. And one Swiss bank admittedly that was part, yeah, uh, or that was subject to the international uh, regulatory regime but that failed because of truly idiosyncratic factors, uh, uh, serious flaws in governments, in behavior, in culture, misinvestment, frauds, and what have you. And I don't think any supervisory regime can, can ever exclude such failures from happening. I think it's actually evidence to the contrary that the financial system withstood this interest rate shock very, very well. And why did it do so, and I'm now talking about the banking side, eh, just to be very precise, because I do believe that the financial reform agenda that we rolled out after the global financial crisis of 2008-2009 significantly strengthened the resilience of the banking sector, and the banking sector is at the core of the financial system. We did have some issues in the non-bank area. We did have some issue with investment funds, mutual funds, and the like, and so central banks did have to engage into some extraordinary financial market interventions in March 2020 after the Archegos case, the UK LDI uh, crisis and the like. But in the, on the banking side, the results have been surprisingly favorable and we have hardly seen any financial instabilities despite a massive increase in interest rates. 
think uh, on the note of that question, I think it's a perfect time to get into your work uh, in charge of the Financial Stability Board, which uh, when you started, you started to face one of the most hectic economic challenges where you have to figure out how to sustain economic growth, control inflation, and also ensure financial stability. So what for you were the trade-offs when thinking about this trilemma? Well, I always start by saying that financial stability is a prerequisite mm -hmm. for growth and price stability. So I, I don't see a dilemma there, actually. I don't see a dilemma at all. I think there is a wealth of evidence saying that better capitalized banks provide more stable lending to the real economy. There's a wealth of evidence showing that if there is financial instability, governments can more or less forget about all their other social economic sort of goals that they've set themselves. If there is financial instability, you better go out yeah, and make sure that you address the instability and that you avoid your economy yeah, going into tailspin. So I don't think that there is actually a trade-off between financial stability on the one hand and growth and inflation. Now, between growth and inflation, there's always uh, the classical debate that, yes, in the short run, sometimes you may have to increase interest rates to prevent uh, inflation from taking off. In the short run, that may be uh, bad for growth and therefore create some unemployment. In the long run, also there, I believe that price stability is a prerequisite for stable and sustainable growth and sustainable uh, uh, increases in, uh, in prosperity. And also this time around, eh, if you look at the sacrifice ratio, it's remarkable how little uh, unemployment has actually gone up. I mean, the sacrifice ratio, which is eh, the amount of unemployment that one has to tolerate to bring inflation back by, let's say, 1% or so, was almost zero. We essentially disinflated at full employment. That's also has not happened before. Of course, structural factors have helped us a lot. Yeah, the labor market in many advanced economies is structurally tight. That has to do with demographics. But there was also a lot of labor hoarding because apparently the, so a lot of entrepreneurs were expecting, yeah, these guys need to raise interest rates because they have a problem with their inflation mandate. But given that they are credible and given that we think that they will be successful in bringing inflation down, this will only be a temporary hiccup in interest rates. And since the labor market is so tight, I don't want to lay off my workers because if I need them again in two years, maybe I may not be able to find them again. And so in that sense, this time around, there has hardly been any trade-off also between uh, growth and inflation. Yeah. And staying the topic of the Financial Stability Board, macroprudential regulation is one of the major tools used to guarantee the safety of our financial system, but it's mostly based on legislating capital requirements to handle the shocks institutions face during the time of a crisis. Do you believe this is the FSB's most powerful tool? Um, just to get it right, uh, the FSB doesn't have any yeah. tools itself. We coordinate international standard setting. Standards then get translated into legislation by the legislator, by, uh, which in our case is the EU, because financial uh, regulation is uh, delegated to Brussels. And then it is being supervised uh, by supervisory entity. The FSB itself doesn't have tools, but for instance, we at the Netherlands Bank, yeah. we are the macroprudential authority in the Netherlands, so we have macroprudential tools like, for instance, uh, counter-cyclical buffers, uh, systemic relevant buffers, uh, and what have you. Now, the whole idea of macroprudential over and above microprudential is that a microprudential measure is meant to safeguard the safety and soundness of an individual institution. But we know that within the financial sector there are all kinds of forms of interconnectedness, all kinds of interactions, real interconnectedness through exposure, but also a lot of psychological yeah. interconnectedness because uh, the balance sheets are inherently opaque, so they're prone to panics, and if something happens at one institution, all of a sudden people start realizing why is it not happening at other institutions as well, etc. And that gives rise to the concept of systemic risk, and which means that the social costs of failure within the financial uh, sector are much larger, or can be much larger, than the private costs of failure. And whereas microprudential buffers uh, do protect against also private costs of failure, they may not be enough to also protect against the social cost of failure, against systemic risk, 
as we call it. And that's why we need to have these macroprudential add-ons. Now, I do think yeah, that so far the experience is quite good, quite successful with macroprudential uh, buffers, but it is limited to the banking sector. We don't have much experience yet with what macroprudential policy in the non-bank sector, in the more capital markets driven yeah, financial activities uh, would, would, would boil down to. So that is still an area where we have to do more thinking yeah, how we can also complement the more micro prudential concept of resilience, which by the way, yeah, in, in, in market-based finance is not a solvency-based concept, but much more a liquidity, yeah, uh, avoidance of liquidity mismatches, avoiding of these spikes in liquidity demands and, and fire sales that emanate from it. How we can top that up with a macro prudential perspective, that is still something that we have to uh, uh, explore. Now, sort of uh, talking about the financial system in general, some argue that our current regulatory framework and risk measurement systems amplify shocks, where we see financial institutions often responding collectively, either all buying or all selling, which sort of worsens the impacts of these shocks. Do you think crafting regulation that might encourage a more diverse financial system with like specific, specifically individualized or specialized banks might help contain these shocks to specific sectors of the economy? Well, listen, I, I don't think that sort of the regulators should have a view on how the industry should look like. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not central planners in this regard. I mean, we live in a free market economy, so the market needs to develop itself. And I think regulation should be as much technology, technology neutral and should also be uh, as neutral as possible with respect to how sort of the industry is, is, uh, is shaping itself. What regulation should do is of course, uh, when there are amplification mechanisms, it should think about remedies uh, uh, to these amplification mechanisms. For instance, if you have enough buffers, then you can absorb a certain amount of losses without having to engage in fire sales, which would work as an amplifier uh, uh, of these initial uh, initial shocks. So in general, it is a question about buffers, although buffers manifest themselves in different ways in different parts of the financial, uh, financial systems. But heterogeneity within the system is welcome, mm -hmm. but it is not something that supervisors or regulators can actually create. Yeah. So would you say the current opinion among regulators is to better have uh, a, a system that can take the shock as opposed to trying to prevent it in the first place? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of uh, safety and soundness is actually about resilience. Mm -hmm. Shocks will always happen. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the illusion that you can create a system that avoids shocks from happening, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So shocks will happen. So what you need to make sure is that there is enough resilience within the financial industry that they can cope with the shocks. Yeah without giving rise to systemic risk and sort of panicky reactions, fire sales, transmit, and that transmit the shock mm -hmm. uh, through, the, through the entire system. You wanna build these sort of firewalls that the shock hits here, hits here and stops here. It doesn't get uh, transferred to other parts of the financial system as well. And the FSB has raised concerns about how digitalization and social media are speeding up deposit withdrawals, putting more yep. pressure on banks' balance sheets. Given this rapid shift, do you think that banks are now at the point when they need to fundamentally rethink their asset and liquidity management? Well, I like banks to continuously think <laughs> fundamentally about the risks that they run. Um, and I mean, what you correctly pointed out, this is of course a recent trend Yes, that has an impact on the stability of deposits, for instance. And we learned about this trend eh, in the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, where all of a sudden eh, the speed of withdrawals was much faster than, let's say, the bandwidth of speed of withdrawals that we'd seen before in, yeah. in, in, in previous cases. Now, social media can play a role in there. Digitalization can play a role. Eh? The more people sort of do their banking business through their mobile phone, etc. Well, that's a, a minute of seconds, right, in which you can withdraw uh, amounts. So it simply means that banks have to take this into account, that they have to think about liquidity management tools that can deal with this faster withdrawal of deposits. And to the extent that uh, regulatory uh, instruments like the liquidity coverage ratio or the, the net stable funding ratio, uh, we have to calibrate these types of uh, regulatory measures 
And in the calibration, we also have to make assumptions about uh, speed of withdrawal. And we have to, of course, update these uh, assumptions and, and update these, uh, these requirements. That's part of the job. And that's also part what the Basel Committee, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, is currently actually engaged in doing, having another look at liquidity management within the bank, having another look at interest rate risk in the banking book, which was also an important risk driver that manifested itself in those banks. I mean, given the effects of social media now in the banking industry, is the FSB actively tracking social media activity as well? <laughs> no, it, it is more uh, that we have to think through the consequences of social media for the stability yeah. uh, w within uh, the financial system. But let me also say here uh, that the FSB is not against financial in innovation, on the contrary. And the FSB is also not of the opinion that zero risk is the best state of the world. No. I mean, there will always be risk taking in the financial system. There will always have to be risk taking in the real economy because without risk, there will be no returns, right? I mean, there will be no economic growth and etc. What we try to do is to find the right balance and yeah, we do that under a sort of umbrella principle that we call harnessing the benefits while mitigating the risks. Uh, so we want to be technology neutral in our uh, approach. And if you look, for instance, in our, at our approach to crypto assets, what we have tried to look at crypto assets, they are a risky asset. Well, there are more risky assets in the economy, right? And so investor protection principles that we apply to all investments in the economy should also apply to risky uh, investment propositions like uh, crypto assets. And the global framework that we rolled out for the regulation of crypto assets is essentially based on same risk, same activity, same risk, same, same treatment, same regulatory treatment, um, and is based on traditional investor protection safeguards that are also applied elsewhere uh, in the economy. They're a little bit more pertinent in the crypto asset space because the risks are significantly higher given the volatility and, uh, and what have you. Yeah. And out of all the areas of banking that can be regulated, corporate governance seems to always be among the most difficult ones. Indeed, many bankers still feel very safe in their risk profiles because of bailout scenarios being so common, especially in the banks deemed too big to fail. How do we break this cycle? Well, one thing is that after 2008-2009, uh, there was a too big to fail sort of a remedy, um, uh, both on the global level, on the European level. Part of that effort has been to create systemic risk buffers, mm -hmm. uh, the, or uh, the GSIP buffers, the globally systemically uh, important banks that got higher capital requirements so that there is more self-insurance against failure instead of uh, uh, trying to let the, uh, the, the consequences of the failure be borne by the broader society. Resolution regimes have been set up elsewhere, which uh, gives the, give the authorities more tools that if an institution allows uh, a rise into trouble, that it can actually bail in some of the liabilities rather than have a bailout uh, through the taxpayer's uh, system. But of course, none of these sort of regimes can ever be perfect and can cater for every individual failure happening somewhere eh, in the system. I mean, what was important that even if Credit Suisse was ultimately rescued by a white knight, eh, another entity, that the conclusion was that resolution would, there would have been a credible resolution strategy available to the authorities. The fact that the authorities decided not to go there and sort of have a takeover uh, by, uh, by UBS, that was a political choice of the Swiss authorities. But it is important to keep in mind that there was a resolution would have been an executable alternative in this, uh, in this specific situation. And there will be at some day a next instance where yes, there will be a resolution applied to one of these large institutes. Let's hope that we won't have too many of these failures. I mean, it's better, of course, to not have them fail, but the array of instruments that we have available to deal with the failure is much, much larger now than it was 15 years ago. And sort of circling back to your point on crypto, in the past, the FSB has raised concerns about the rapid growth of digital currencies and, of course, the potential 
to destabilize financial markets. Being in your position, what would you say is the biggest challenge when it comes to regulating the sort of dynamic nature of digital currencies itself? Well, as I said, uh, um, crypto assets are a very, very risky investment, but that doesn't mean uh, that sort of we should prohibit these investments. We don't prohibit people from going to the casino either, do we? I mean, so if, uh, if people want to go to the casino, then they can go to the casino. What we do prohibit the casino is to suggest that if you put all your money on red, that you have a 75% probability of winning, uh, because we know that that is a false statement, i.e., we do require, yeah, when there is a risky investment, we do require the sort of suppliers of these assets to be honest about risk distributions, uh, etc. Yeah. We do also uh, require them to have all kinds of governance requirements, separation of funds, right, from uh, the owner of these uh, schemes versus uh, the external people that sort of invest into the scheme. Well, th those things were, went quite sort of in the wrong direction in the FTX failure, right? Where uh, the owner was, took the money of his clients and was sort of filling his own investment gaps by client money. That is not allowed in normal open-ended investment funds, etc. And it should also not be allowed in the crypto space. So the crypto space, however, is a little bit more risky because it's very opaque. And these basic principles of sound investment are actually not, uh, not respected uh, everywhere. Uh, take, for instance, the word stablecoin. Uh, if you look at where the stability of these coins is actually coming from, they are neither stable, uh, they're nor coins, right? And yet they present themselves as stable coins. And, and so I think there is still, there is still a lot of AML CFT, eh? anti-money laundering uh, risks also because of the lack of opaqueness. There is still a lot of money laundering that unfortunately is taking place through crypto assets. We know that that is the case. And also there, uh, the sort of the, 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 yeah, the, the vengeance with which we try to avoid money laundering should be similar in uh, the degree of safety that we are looking for, should be similar also in the crypto space to other financial uh, parts of the financial system. Yeah. Well, of course, on building on that point, there has been regulation with uh, crypto, at least within Europe. You see stuff like my car. Yeah, very but good. As a regulator yourself, do you see certain areas of improvement that can still be added, or is it good as it is now? Well, I, I think we have to learn. I mean, this is a rapidly emerging mm -hmm. area, and so I don't think uh, that the regulation is ever finished. Uh, so we have to keep our eyes open. Uh, for that purpose, within the FSB, we have our financial innovation network, which is in close contact all the time, mm -hmm. eh, monitoring these developments and also talking to people in the industry with what's going on. And I think quite frequently, regulation will have to be updated. But this is a little bit eh, the fate of regulation. I mean, innovation takes place within the industry. Then we have to learn about the innovation. Then we have to come to an assessment of the risks. And then we can come forward with a regulatory response. That means we will always be, to some extent, behind the curve. That, I mean, that is, that is inherent in the division of responsibilities here. Now, I think MICAR is, is quite a proactive sort of eh, piece of regulation where, compared to other parts in the world, I think Europe stands out quite nicely. But MICAR also is not the end of the story. It will have to be updated. I think eh, the industry will innovate and will change, and MICAR will have to respond. And as the president of the DNB and chair of FSB, how worried are you personally with traditional monetary policy becoming ineffective because of such product? I don't think uh, that that is a worry um, that I believe, yeah, that I attach uh, a lot of value to. I think the financial system has always undergone changes and uh, monetary policy makers have always have been able to design instruments to deliver on their mandate it, it will change monetary transmission, but monetary transmission is always subject to change as soon as there are changes in the financial, uh, financial system. And that means that we will have, may have to design different uh, instruments. Interest rates, however you want to structure the financial system, will always continue to play a role 
risk premia will always continue to play a role. And there you have sort of two levers on which uh, monetary policy tries to work, primarily through interest rates. But sometimes, uh, when it comes to asset purchases and, and, and longer-term refinancing operations, also when we believe uh, that some of the risk premia are out of line with where, where, where we think they should be. I, well, in sum, I am very optimistic on the capacity of, of monetary policy makers to come forward with instruments uh, so that they can continue to deliver on their mandate. Yeah, and uh, staying within the crypto space, there's this idea of a central bank digital currency, of course, which could solve the issue and strengthen monetary policy against the decentralization of finance. Or would you say it's more about how it might disrupt the traditional role of banks within the economy in terms of monetary no, policy? No, no, no. The, the intention of a CBDC is to be a payments instrument, mm -hmm. not a store of value instrument. Yeah? So I don't think it has anything to do with sort of disrupting yeah, the traditional financial intermediary role that banks play. I don't think that the size of any CBDC, yeah, it, will be, it will be more like cash in a digital manifestation. Yeah. And the amount of cash that people hold to do transactions is of course not yeah, of a size that is comparable to the amount of the deposits that are being held in the banks. There will also not be any remuneration on the CBDC, so it will also, in terms of incentives, yeah, not so interesting for people to hold an enormous amount of their wealth in terms of, uh, of a central bank digital currency. Now, I think the simple case uh, why CBDC, I think, is going to come, if the whole world digitalizes, of course, central banks should also digitalize. And let's not forget it. Uh, we, uh, the payments and the financial system has always been a combination of public money and private money, where public money is a direct liability from the central bank to whatever you will have in your wallet. And private money is money generated by the banks, where commercial banks are sort of sitting in between the central bank and, and the customer that wants to do a payment. Cash is gradually uh, uh, facing a diminished use in, in society. Young people don't wear any cash anymore. You don't use any cash anymore. So if we were not to respond to this development, then what we would see is that the financial system would gradually morph into a situation where we would only have private money and no public issued money anymore. And I think, I think that's an undesirable uh, situation. There's a good reason, safety, resilience, and now I would also say strategic autonomy. Why we do want to have public money and continue to have public money, although in the future that will probably more manifest itself in a digital format than in a cash format. Although, let me be also very clear on this, we are not actively pushing out cash. Cash will be available until the last customer that wants to use cash. We just observe that the amount of customers that is willing to use cash is gradually, yeah, uh, is gradually uh, diminishing. But then on that note, do you believe we will reach a point ever in which there will be only digital currencies? I'm not a fortune teller. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, economists are known for their predictions. Uh, I mean, I think that the, the demise of cash has been uh, already uh, announced a few times before, and it hasn't happened so far. And one of the reasons is, of course, anonymity. Uh, that cash, anonymity and fidelity. If you do a, a transaction in cash, the transaction is final the moment cash has changed hands. It's completely anonymous. We will try to mimic these characterizations also with respect to the central bank digital, uh, digital currency. Um, and the moment that people will get sort of full confidence in, yeah, in the success of these achievements, then I don't know what will happen to cash. But as long as this is not yet the case and this is still in development, I think there will always be a demand for, uh, for cash. Maybe not so much in Dutch society, but clearly in other societies uh, in the Euro area uh, where they are, yeah, where they have had a a little bit more reason to distrust some of the old institutions, etc., than we've had in the Netherlands. So. Yeah, I mean, you did just say you were not a fortune teller, <laughs> but as we wrap up this interview, I wanted to just get your opinion on what you think, given your experience in the FSB and the DNB, and of course ECB as well, what do you think the next big unknown challenge will be for financial stability? <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, that is impossible to say. I, I mean, when I think about the coming years, there is more geopolitical risk. 
and geopolitical risk translates itself into geoeconomic fragmentation. And how intense that fragmentation will be, we don't know. But of course, we just had a presidential debate in the US uh, where the word tariff was being used quite frequently. Um, uh, there are more places in the world where I think uh, barriers, trade barriers are now being erected where previously they weren't. So that will provide a whole set of new risks. Um, it will uh, lead to a more difficult diffusion of new technology. It will have a negative impact on productivity growth, but it will also negatively impact upon our capacity to come together and, and jointly solve global problems and global issues. Yeah? One of the successes of the remedy of the 2008-2009 global financial crisis was that the leaders of the G20 came together and they decided that they would jointly remedy the effects of the crisis and that it would not happen again. And that was a, a big success of international cooperation and international coordination. Now ask yourself the question, if we have a similar crisis tomorrow, would it not be much more difficult in today's world to actually again get sort of this common spirit at the G20 table, given that some of the countries are at war with each other nowadays and that we have all these sort of fragmentary uh, yeah, developments going on. So I do think that that is an area that we have to think very seriously about. Uh, what does geoeconomic fragmentation also mean for our capacity to deal with global issues, climate change. Yeah, haven't mentioned climate change yet, but that's a, our climate is a global public good. That's not a local, it's a global public good. We can only tackle it jointly. Now, that's a lot easier yeah, if you sort of, if the, the less fragmentation there is, politically and economically. So these are the kinds of things that we need to think through. Where the next shock will come from, I don't know. We have to build resilience against the shocks. Again, that I think is a much more fruitful approach to take. We have done so, and I believe relatively successful on the banking side. We still have a little bit of an agenda, uh, unfinished business on the non-banking side, on the capital markets uh, side. And on that lovely note, President Knott, thank you so much for your time. It's been a really insightful conversation. Thank you to everyone in the audience who spent their time being here. And for those of you who can't get enough room for discussion, we have excellent news. On 18th of November at 1 p.m., we will host Carol Hendricks, who is a Deputy General of Doctors Without Borders and the Director of the Dutch branch of this organization. So be there. And finally, on the 21st of November, we will be hosting Jose Manuel Campa, the President of the European Banking Authority. So if you found today interesting, definitely be there between 3 and 4 on the 21st of November. And with that, so a final round of applause for President Knott.